This episode is brought to you by DistroKid. Hey everyone, today's guest is Trevor Riley, guitarist for the new Bedford, Massachusetts melodic hardcore band, A Wilhelm Scream. Together we rip back the covers and dive headfirst into the writing, recording, and inspiration behind the fan favorite song, Boat Builders, taken from their 2013 album, Party Crasher. A Wilhelm Scream is one of those bands that begs the question, are they punk? Are they metal? Are they hardcore? And the answer is yes, all of the above, along with a whole bunch of awesomeness. It was great to catch up with Trevor, and he unlocked a ton of questions I had about boat builders. The lyrics are awesome, and Trevor credits the honesty and relatability of the lyrics to being the underdogs, a group of regular guys defying the odds of being a successful band from New Bedford. Having previously worked with producers Bill Stevenson and Jason Livermore, the band struck out on their own this time, with Trevor sharing the production duties with then guitarist Mike Sapina, and the results are glorious. This is a band I've seen grow leaps and bounds with each passing year, and a group of guys I also consider dear friends. So for all this, and a cameo from Trevor's father Joe, don't you dare touch that dial. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Hey, hey, have you heard? Krista makes a podcast. Trevor, my man. Chris. <laughs> you know, we were uh, talking before we started rolling here that you guys are one of those bands that uh, I just saw you. You, you popped up here. Uh, I, I saw your face this morning. You got this big smile. We don't have to see each other every year or two or even three, but the minute we do, it's all smiles and laughs. We pick right uh, back up where we left off. So it's great to see you. It's great to see you too, Chris. Yeah, you guys are less than Jake guys. All you guys, just the most down to earth dudes and. Like we were saying before, no awkwardness at all. Yeah. You know, it doesn't matter how many years it's been. doesn't matter. It's like it was yesterday. You guys were one of the first bands that ever took Wilhelm Scream out on tour, too. So we always have a huge spark in our hearts for you guys. You guys are the best. You guys are super fun. You guys are one of those bands that I, I still think of you as kids till I run into you. And I'm like, these guys aren't kids anymore because <laughs> you've been around for darn near a quarter of a century. And I kind of took a crash course uh, with you guys here. We'll, we'll get there in a second. But uh, our friendship continues on. We're heading to Europe uh, with you guys pretty soon to do, uh, do a bunch of uh, club dates. And uh, you guys in Death by Stereo, I cannot wait. By the time this episode comes out that will have already happened but uh found out you guys are going to be on the run and uh the whole band was just collectively so excited oh us too man we're like oh fuck yeah this is great <laughs> yeah i just loved i love seeing my friends grow as artists and as musicians you know i thought you guys were a great band 20 years ago and Thanks. you're just a better band now you've had more time you as a producer you've learned your way around the studio and you know in researching for this episode i had no idea i knew you were around since the late 90s but i had no idea and, and you listen to the show you know i don't get into band names or who you know the first manager that stole all your money none of those <laughs> those those backstories but i had no idea you were called smack and isaiah before a wilhelm scream yeah <laughs> <laughs> very 90s of you <laughs> yeah <laughs> Smack and Isaiah might be worse than less than Jake, uh, as far as 90s goes. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if no. a scream is that much better, but I mean, it's slightly slight improvement. Slight improvement. Well, you, you, <laughs> you guys will probably take it. You released a record in 2000, uh, and then in 2001, you released an album under the Smack and Isaiah uh, moniker as Benefits of Thinking out loud, but you re-released that record as a Wilhelm Scream record. I didn't know that. I thought your first record was Mute Print on Nitro in 04. It was. Mute Print's definitely the first Wilhelm Scream record. I think with the benefits of thinking out loud, that's definitely a Smack and Isaiah record. I think that the the record label that we were with at the time, they kind of convinced us to uh, to put the new band name on it. It's something that I that I regret, you know, agreeing to. Yeah. I will say that that, that album is definitely where we started to kind of find our sound a little bit. I think what had happened was we had heard At the Gates and In Flames yeah. and said, holy fuck, <laughs> <laughs> this, 
this is like Iron Maiden, but on steroids or yeah. something. Yeah. You know, and just fell in love with that whole thing. The whole guitar mini thing just like blew blew our minds. And I think that's really when we started started writing songs like that and started thinking of guitar as another almost like another vocal well and and you guys it's the age-old question a band like yours are, are you guys punk are you metal are you hardcore uh, are you thrash because all those elements are there and there's just i could see you guys touring with so many bands you just have uh i think the capability of, of fitting in with any of the heaviest bands any of the fastest bands regardless of genre yeah we've been lucky I think our sound, I mean, there was nothing really deliberate about it. I think just our attention spans, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and and also writing so many songs, you know, especially in the early days, we were so prolific. I, and I was probably writing like, you know, a song a week, bringing it to practice and basically finding our way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from playing with so many bands, especially in the early 2000s, man, there were so many different types of styles of genres and you know, you say hardcore, it's like, what oh, What kind of hardcore? You know, you yeah. get the emo hardcore, you know, you get the post-hardcore, which is what we refer to like the hot water music type bands, which is super influential. Let's not forget how we were getting, starting to get our information then too, you know, full on dawn of the internet. So, I mean, yeah. that's when, to your point, the just styles were colliding. It's like, whoa, what is this? This band's expanding on a sound that was there. But like you said, now it's, it's like uh, Iron Maiden, but on steroids. Yeah. I think for us, it kind of just comes down to, you know, what makes us giggle at practice, you know, or yeah. what, you know, it's like, you know, if somebody in the band is laughing, then you know that you did something cool and that you're kind of onto something, you yeah. know, because it's like, oh my God, I can't believe we came up with, you know, because I mean, most of this shit, you know, you come up with by accident. <laughs> sure. Yeah. By, by accident or just a riff you had in your phone forever. And you're finally, you're like, you know what? I'm going to do something with this. You bring it to practice and the rest of the guys jump on the riff. And five minutes later, you have a song, you know, less than Jake's got other history with you guys in, uh, in the form of Bill Stevenson and Jason Livermore out at the blasting room and Andrew Berlin, uh, who mixed, uh, this particular record party crasher which i'm gonna call party crasher your third record not your fourth record absolutely okay <laughs> released absolutely. <laughs> released in 2013 and uh, the song we're talking about today boat builders that's the first track on the record but uh talk about the blasting room a little bit because you know the one thing that i love about bill and jason they don't do too much they, they don't do any of changing a band's integrity or who the band is. Listen to any of their stuff. Rise Against, Descendants, Less Than Jake. You guys, that's what you sound like. I mean, the productions, it, it's crisp, it's sharp, but I feel like, and that's why I said when we were trying to decide what song for this episode, I feel like everything really came together with you guys with Party Crasher. Oh, thank you. Um, that's definitely the, a big tribute to all those guys over there at the Blasting Room. Uh, Bill and Jason, particularly, they were the first producer that we ever worked with up until that point my whole life um i've just recorded with my dad my dad's always had a project studio in my house growing up so going back to you know i'll be eight years old doing drum checks for him and seeing all the bands kind of coming in you know you could you could see the trends of the day you know when i was really young it was like 80 more like hair metal bands as i became a teenager it was more grunge and stuff like that and like just seeing my dad kind of be just all positive he didn't really push a lot he he it, it was all positive reinforcement when it was time to go to the blasting room that was the first time that we had seen that you know we didn't know what to expect we didn't know what a click track was uh -huh. we didn't know any of these modern recording <laughs> techniques like punching in and shit like that we're like what is this yeah you know um our poor drummer nick he had never played to a click track before and they 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 kind of busted it out on him and he's like what mm -hmm. and that that was for the mute print album we had 10 days to do that record uh mixing included and at this point it was just bill and jason doing everything over there they didn't have they didn't have all uh, all of the uh 
what do you call them? Uh, the uh, interns second, and yeah, stuff. Yeah, interns and second engineers to help out. Yeah, helping out and 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 stuff like that. Um, I will say, after this record, they did. <laughs> <laughs> I think it. I think it changed. Uh, I think it changed them a little bit. That uh, their workflow over there. Well, man, as you know, Nick, your drummer's a monster. He's one of my. Oh yeah. He's one of my favorite drummers, I, and and one of my favorite people. He's he's an absolute sweetheart of a person. But you know, his drumming is amazing. But you want to frustrate any drummer? I don't care how good they are if they've never played in a click go hey kid here's this and for the listeners i'm going to throw this in layman's terms we've talked about it a little bit but the click track is just a metronome that's in time that the drummer's playing to and there's an old saying trevor i'm sure you've heard it the click doesn't lie because <laughs> the, dr- the drummer likes to tell us that we're speeding up okay oh it's the bass player's <laughs> fault it's like um no you're the one playing you're the one playing the backbeat here you're the foundation yeah nick was i mean a champion you know going for it you know that's one thing like on that record wow it was anxiety inducing and and but for us we had this kind of shorthand with each other i think it's kind of our our east coast vibe Mm -hmm. where we're constantly ripping on each other and nobody takes it personally but you know constant ripping and (laughs) in in that high stress environment it was sort of it was sort of necessary and necessary for us and I think that kind of endeared us to them because Bill and Jason, they they were like, whoa, okay, these guys, these guys are pushing their own buttons here mm-hmm. and pushing each other to kind of do this thing. And everyone was under the gun. Well, and it, it also sounds like you guys were really paying attention to what you were doing because you branched out on this record, Party Crasher. It was produced by yourself. And am I pronouncing this right? Mike, Mike Sapina? Yes. Yeah, okay. So Mike was your, your lead guitarist and backing vocalist at this time. The record was recorded at Black and Blue Studio in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Is is that your dad's place? That's my dad's place, okay, yeah. Okay, because I was reading online and I read the, I saw the last time I said that's got to be his dad. So that's that's awesome that uh you know, by this point, 2013 having made a couple records at the Blasting Room, you were confident in enough in your ear and your abilities to craft this record. You went back uh, to get Andrew Berlin at the Blast Room to mix the album. I also noticed there was an engineering credit by James Witten for this uh, album. Is he an intern at Black and Blue? No, James Witten had been our longtime sound guy. Oh, okay. Our uh, front of house engineer um, toured the world with us. He he does great work in New Orleans. He's got a studio there now uh, as well. And he was huge. Um, he wasn't there for the whole time because he... Uh, he also, at that point in time, he was also doing Front of House for Streetlight Manifesto. So he had like a tour uh, previously booked. And uh, Mike and I, we really took our time with things. You know, we're sort of like perfectionist kind of people. So the recording took a lot longer, you know, so he wasn't able to be there for the entire thing. But he was very instrumental, especially um, getting us going on that album, you know, getting like the drum tones and uh, guitar tones and stuff like that. So yeah, James was huge on that on that as well. But um, uh, Mike and myself, we uh, we we kind of brought it home, so to speak. Right on. Well, the band lineup is the same that was on this record: Nuno on vocals, you on guitar, uh, Brian Robinson on bass and backing vocals, and uh, Nick Angelini on the drums. Uh, Mike was replaced and is Ben by Ben Murray. Is Ben still in the band today? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Ben's awesome. Ben Ben comes from a band called Heart Sounds. Um, oh wow! Great. Yeah. Awesome band. They were on Epitaph a while back, and uh, just an awesome friend for a long time. Fucking crazy good guitarist. Yeah. Can't wait to see him shred with you soon. Yeah, man. Well, uh, we got to jump into this track, buddy. It's three minutes and 50 seconds. I could sit here and talk to you all day and not even get into this, but we got to jump in. (laughs) Boat Builders, first track out of 11 on the record. A lone, distorted guitar hits a single note that sounds like it is getting unwound by hand, the string. Then there's a little bass three-noter accompanied by a kick tom and three hits on the bell of the ride cymbal. And then the whole band is in. Stereo guitars, bass, and drums. That stereo guitar panned off left is a little more playful throughout this whole song. Uh, Production just sounds killer here. Uh, Stereo, bass, and drums in. The stereo guitars are playing off of each other for 16 bars. It's really 
uplifting this part, but it tugs at my emotional heartstrings, Trevor, with the minor arpeggios that are happening, again, more predominantly uh, playful on that left guitar. The next four bars are what I call a verse setup. Hardcore bands would do this, where they just cut, had this riff that would just go, the pit would get going, and then the vocals would come in. And man, when, when I was really getting this uh, under the microscope here, I was just like, man, this takes me back to like DRI or something, you know? I call it the setup, a verse setup. Uh, and these four bars are just insanely catchy guitars playing super fast trills together. Uh, just so catchy. And the bass and drums are just pummeling here. <laughs> move any further did you do a demo for this song do you remember the because the arrangement here is just insane what nick is doing and how the parts all come together i'm wondering how much of this was flushed out in the studio or was this kind of it well with this one this actually kind of goes back to blasting room a little bit um one of my biggest takeaways from recording with them was the idea of doing uh tempo maps which is basically like a map of the whole song done in Pro Tools. Mm -hmm. And one thing when working with Bill, particularly on those early records, he would say, hey, Trev, why don't you come in here, play each part for me? And he'd kind of like tap them out. And what I discovered what he was doing was he was sort of creating dynamics tempo-wise yes. in the song. So when learning that, he said, okay, play that chorus. And, he's, and I would play the chorus like to the point where I feel like I'm cooking, you know, I feel like it's rocking. It's like, you know, the, in, the intention. Yeah. And so with that for party crasher, we demoed the living shit out of every song. So like if, if you kind of looked at the tempo map, you it would be like, okay, 180 BPM, 182, 184, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like for, for each section based on like what the riff would be. And, I feel like that's sort of like future proofing the songs to a certain degree for me. Whereas, you know, because I know that after we play some of these songs live for two years, we're going to be playing them fast. Yes. And I know that people are going to come up to me and say, oh, your records are good, but like, oh, you guys, oh, you guys are amazing <laughs> live. Yeah. And I'll be like, oh, fuck, you yeah. know, like, yeah, you know, that's, you know, like it's, it's sort of like a, like a double-edged compliment you know it's like shit man well what the tempo map does is it it affords you groove in places you may not have had groove and what the tempo map means what trevor was saying you know you it's that metronome so if you have the metronome set at 182 and it's going along sometimes that's the whole song right at that same exact tempo but here you're going in and saying man the chorus needs to be pushed it needs to be a little more intense listen to where the vocal's sitting you know a lot of times it's yeah. about the vocal how is the vocal getting jumbled is it too fast or is it too slow for the vocal delivery and you'll you'll push those tempos up but uh what this does is kind of gives you an urgency and you know look when we play live especially a ba you know, band like mine it's all over the place the choruses are going to speed up or slow down depending on the song and uh that gives it that realness yeah definitely Definitely. And like, I know that, I know that our drummer, Nick, you know, he, he's great. I mean, he, you know, he plays with emotion, you know, so like, sometimes it's not always speeding up either. Like, the, you know, there's certain songs in our set where like, he'll play slower than the album. Yeah. And we'll kind of mention it to him. And he's like, yeah, I did that deliberately. All those things, all those lessons that we learned doing those three records out in Colorado with those guys, like, we just followed that playbook to a T, you know, especially on, on this album, you know, coming out the gate with that. So a lot of demoing. And every time we would go to do a new album, we would demo like crazy. And really, um, like, we'd spend so much time doing pre-production -pre on our own, like, partly because, hey, we're going to go spend tens of thousands of dollars. We're not, I'm not trying to go in there and rewrite the song unless there's a great suggestion or yeah or something you know of course my, my mind is open to that like you know absolutely let's make these songs better let's make them cooler but um i think f 
I could speak for all of us in the band that none of us want to be the person that, you know, was unprepared going into a situation like that. It starts with the demo. Right on. Verse one, you got to tell me what's going on here in Boat Builders. And uh, I know, I believe you said that that Nuno wrote the lyrics to this one. I wrote most of the lyrics. And it, um, you did. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I've been writing songs with, with Nuno since I was a kid. Like, you know, we started playing together, I think we were 15. And uh, I was the drummer in the band at the time. And before meeting up with Nuno, I was the lead singer and drummer. So... A lot of my songwriting, I go to the vocal first. Not necessarily lyrics, but like melody sure. and cadence always be really important to me. And the way that I would work with Nuno in the past was the way that Nuno would write is that he would usually write lyrics. So he'd, he'd have all the lyrics written out, almost like a, almost like a poem. Mm -hmm. And in his amazing handwriting as well. So it was also like cool to look at. <laughs> you know, those are things I always like really took away from him. So with this song, I had started out writing the song. Oh, and that detuned thing you were talking about? Yeah. That's my dad. Well, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Your dad made yeah, the recording. Yeah. I love it. Oh, my dad made the recording. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> he plays at the end. He, he does the he does the solo at the, the lead at the end. Okay. Well, this is making a lot of sense now because I was going to talk. That solo sounds almost odd and out of place in this song i love that yes. your dad played i'm smiling ear to ear because this is all making sense i love it yeah you can see it on youtube as well we we, we filmed it on our it looks like a film filmed on a potato but um yeah but basically like i started writing it on acoustic so jamming it out and for me it always come like the hooks come first the hooks are so important to me like lyrics is is sort of when the the i guess the craft comes into play yeah you know but that hook is where the magic of all this shit, you know, writing songs, the the, the magic, that's like the juice, you know? And and just the guitars alone in this song are just so hooky. And the vocals are too, but everything here is just, and how it all works together. But verse one, I, I have to know what's happening in Boat Builders. Voted in and get another in the bank, spoiled by my riches. I had a lie to remember and I wrote it in the sand, tried to go get it. Phone it in again. Another in bank. Spoiled by the riches. I had a line to remember, and I wrote it in the sand. Tried to go get it, but the tide swooned. Yeah, so that's a reference to, um, especially at that time, I, well, back in the day, it was on cassette tapes. Mm -hmm. And once we started to get cell phones and stuff like that, I would jot down uh, hooks, lyric ideas, um, sometimes riff ideas that I just I just go da na 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 you know style, and just fill up my phone with that. So uh, phone it in again, another in the bank. I'm spoiled by my riches. Sort of like a double meaning to that. Uh, the first is the literal. I'm literally putting these ideas in my phone, and then phone it in again. It's kind of like the self deprecating nature that I put in a lot of my lyrics. And spoiled by my riches. You know, basically what I do is. After we do an album, you know, there might be years in between, and I just fill up my phone as I'm walking. Ideas, you know, you just got to be ready to pull them out of the ether yeah. <laughs> as you're walking down the street, you know, oh, there's, oh, there's that line. Oh, I'm going to use that in a song. And I just stockpile these ideas. And then uh, I go back and I listen over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. Sometimes, like right when I go to sleep and stuff like that. So they become ingrained a part of me. I used to do that back in the day because we would practice every Monday. And when we come to band practice, I want a song at the end of that practice, mm -hmm. right? So if we're jamming on something, I know that in the back of my head subconsciously, I've got probably four or five hooks of some sort that I can bust out just kind of while we're playing. What do you guys think of this? And then the guys will say, oh, did you just come with that? Oh, yes, I did. I just came up yeah. with that. That's right. Well, that's, yes. that's, uh. a great, uh, <laughs> that's a great tool to have in your arsenal, you know, to be able to know I got 400 voice memos sitting back here on my phone, but they're also swirling in my head, a lot of them. And I don't know if you're like me. It sounds like you are where you're like, oh, that riff in E would work very well here in this bridge part. And you say yes. it to the guys, and, and sometimes it works uh, perfectly, and as you know, sometimes it doesn't. But to be able to have that information, that bank of, of riffs to pull from is awesome. Yeah, definitely. And I'm, 
I'm definitely not shy about um, just singing something or just trying it out. I'm not sure. afraid to look corny, you know? I'm not afraid to look, uh, oh, did that suck? You know, you could tell me, and Nick's <laughs> always the one to tell me. Nick, will, like, Nuno's always like super supportive uh, with it. He's kind of like, no, I think it's cool. Oh, I think that's cool, Trev, you know? But Nick will like tell me what he really thinks, you know? So I always kind of look to Nick. I'm like, you know, the uh, <laughs> the everyman. He'll call you out on your corniness. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, that, that's what and you I, need. And I'll that, be like, thanks. <laughs> those band checks and balances. Will we get some killer harmonies on Spoiled by the Riches? and tried to go get it, but the tide swooned. Also on those lines with harmonies, sounds like the uh, lead vocal is doubled there. The band is still ripping super fast through this whole part. Harmonies are so, so good and so catchy. And then we get into pre-chorus one. We got the lucky ones, we ain't got it so bad. Baby, you go wild and sometimes you ain't you, bad. We are the lucky ones. We ain't got it so bad. Baby, you go all in. Sometimes you win. You bet. I guess what I meant by that was, you know, th- this song in general, some of it, you know, when you're a band, you know, a local band, you know, we're from a city, but we're not from a big city that everybody knows. It's sort of about get, you know, putting yourself out there, you know, go for it. Put all your eggs in that basket. You got one life, you know, you got one chance to do this, you know, and all of this work that we put in, in the base, you know, in the basement, all the practicing we do, all the writing that we do, working on our craft, and then all the other bullshit that goes along with it, you know, trying to get signed and all that all that stuff. I guess it's kind of like a rallying, like a rallying cry. And it's but I think more than anything, it's just kind of like gratitude. You know, we've been lucky to have supporters that have been into what into what we do and also our our own support system. So that's sort of what I think that's sort of what I meant by that. Very cool. Not like hey, we made it, but you kind of fucking did. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would say. Look at the odds here, you know? Yeah. Odds are I could be a fucking brain surgeon <laughs> more than become like a rock star. Yeah, it's sort of that thing. It's not bragging. It's it's kind of just like, hey. No, you know? it's, uh, it, it's taking stock of what you have, what you've built, and being grateful for it. And, you know, our bands are light years ahead of most bands. I have friends of mine, you do too, that would, you know, probably uh, give their left foot to be doing what we do. And that's definitely not lost on me. Some really cool things here in pre-chorus one. You know, we we get those harmonies on the first couple lines. We are the lucky ones. We ain't got it so bad, but they're really subtle here. They're not like the verses super loud. They're tucked back here. The lead vocal, however, does sound doubled in this section. And uh, tempo changes here. Nick's drumming and accents are just so interesting. And what he is doing here, you get to the last uh, line, the last vocal, you bet. Uh, That's just Nuno by himself, just the vocals. But the drum groove here from pre-chorus one continues into chorus one. It sounds, and I'm going to keep this, again, in layman's terms, it sounds like the drum groove here, Trevor, seems backwards. It seems flipped on the chorus mm-hmm. here for the first two lines, and it's it's just awesome. You bet we are the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers, here be no guts, no glory, there be no guts, no glory, tell me why did I wait so long to break these chains around me. We are the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers. It's that line right there where those drums kind of feel like they're they're flipped. That's the, the only term I can really think of, like the beats backwards. And then the band goes super fast for the rest of chorus one. Here be no guts, no glory. There be no guts, no glory. Tell me why I'd wait so long to break these chains around me. What's happening there? Well, the first line there... Um... We are the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers. That's Nuno's line. I was like, Nuno, you know, hit me with some lyrics. You know, what do you got? So like he sent, uh, I think the title might have been Modern Wayfarers. Mm -hmm. So basically, so what I did was I would take his lyrics and I'd read them. And then as I read them, certain lines and phrases would just pop out to me, you know. And when I'm reading lyrics i think it's just from listening to music so much and paying so much attention to lyrics in my favorite songs over the years certain cadences will kind of come to me as i'm reading them and i'll say oh oh i could you know take this line here i love this theme this here 
You know what I mean? So it would be sort of, I would be sort of highlighting his lyrics and sort of applying it to what I got. And that, that's been a way that I've been working with Nuno like since I was 15. That's such a great way because that that breeds creativity with you too. He might hit you with a lyric that goes, oh, wow. And now you'll take the song somewhere else. Super inspiring, man. Yeah. I mean, I love his lyrics. You know, I love his ideas and it definitely inspires me. And once you can get that once you can get that train rolling and the rock rolling down the hill, man, it's so fun. So we are the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers. Great line from Nuno. And his song, his lyrics that, you know, I added to this were very centric to New Bedford, you know, where one of the, still to this day, one of the largest fishing ports in the world, uh, like right down the street from me. And like the lineage and, you know, of of the boat builders, you know, sort of, a metaphor for like what we what we all do we're setting sail around the world around the country and that kind of thing you know what i mean and the line uh here be no guts no glory there be no guts no glory that was the first thing i came up with i think for the song and that just comes right out of like moby dick you know like herman melville that was written in new bedford all of the themes are very deliberate. <laughs> you know, the well, tide swoon. Uh, yeah, and you very, know, very inter- clearly, yeah. Very intertwined. No, and I again I'm smiling because I was hoping to get to this. And I had a feeling from the part of the country that you're in, the fishing industry, etc., that it was gonna tie back. And I just I just love hearing that. And it's just it's so crazy. You started out with this idea for a song, and then Nuno gives you a line, and then well, this creeps in because of where we live, and hey, we're kind of like boat builders. We take our craft on the road and it's just, it, it's amazing how we get back to, oh, well, this is just a song. It's a form, almost a four minute song, but you know, yeah. it, look what it took to create, uh, to create this whole thing. Again, those first two lines, we're the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers. In between those, we get a triumphant, whoa, oh, a gang vocal. Went and watched some live videos on this. And you see the hands in the air for that part. I love oh, yeah. it. You didn't overdo it. You could have had the whoa o's in there more. Was there ever a discussion like we need another whoa o or was that it? I think that was it. I don't remember exactly. I know that there's so many decisions to be made <laughs> in a song. You know, you know that. Like whoa o's are easy to get suckered into and want to overdo them. They they're, are. They're so catchy, and you guys, yeah. as you you know, you guys are a live band like we are. We th- I always think in live terms. How's this going to yeah. go over? Oh, we got to give them another whoa o, but. Where you put it here is perfect. The second line, here be no guts, no glory. The whole band goes fast for the rest of chorus one. On the third line, we get a pick slide uh, on the guitar uh, over to the left. The vocals, the lead vocal is doubled throughout here, but it's more loose than the other parts of the song where it's double. It's a bit loose here, but it feels real. It feels awesome. It's not super lined up and, and, and processed. Uh, and then we get an awesome harmony on Tell Me Why I'd Wait So Long to Break These Chains Around Me before we go into a four-bar reintro. It's that verse setup again from the intro. Uh, like I said, it kind of reminds me of an old thrash hardcore uh, trick. You know, you you get in, get you got to get the the uh, the pit going before the vocals come in. I just I just love this part when it comes on and and the riffing guitar sounds so crisp. We share without knowing, screams soaring in every direction. We sweat like boat builders and marvel at our work, smiling at the imperfections. And that's the only uh, spot in the song where we get the title. Love that lyric. That's all Nuno right there. I love that lyric too. And I've always loved songs that either you don't give the song title, or if you do, it's just in a lyric somewhere. It's not the refrain, the chorus, you're hitting the listener over the head with saying boat builders 15 times. I love that it's there. So this is, this is Nuno's work here. This is like my favorite contribution of his to the song. Like I said, I mean, just reading his lyrics, that whole thing just really stuck out to me. It's like, oh, here we go. This is the song I'm trying to write here. Because the why did I wait so long, like that, that was the second hook I came into that sort of came to me. I need two of them, Chris. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I, I need at least two hooks that I that I can like hang my hat on and say, okay, we're good. Let's have some fun now. The shit that you, you grab out of the ether, the hooks you grab out of the ether, okay, they've been they've been grabbed, like Pokemon style or whatever. You know, yeah. I caught I caught what I needed to catch. 
Now, let's find out what this song is about. And reading those words that he wrote there, that stuck out to me. So like, yeah, pull that out. Love that lyric. And for me, I think I could speak for him when I say this. That line, I mean, that's the that's the live show. That's the live experience. That's that's the juice that makes us stand up straighter when we're on the road. Well, you know? that, that's very apparent here in verse two. Screams soaring yeah. in every direction. We sweat like boat builders and marvel at our work, smiling at the imperfections. Isn't that two are all rolled up into, into three lines? The harmonies Outside. are so good here, uh, especially on the line, marvel at our work. Something that happens there in the harmony just gives me chills. Stereo guitars, bass, and drums are flying here again on verse two. The bass tone and bass runs are so catchy and uh, so well oh, thought yeah. out. Brian is so good. He <sighs> he God. doesn't get mentioned in the circles of bass players. I feel uh, it, it's unfair. Um, he, it's he, a crime. It's a crime. He is such... <laughs> Such a great, uh, great player. Uh, pre-chorus, phenomenal bassist. Absolutely phenomenal. Pre-chorus yeah. two comes right off of verse two. We are the lucky ones. We ain't got it so bad, baby. You go all in. Sometimes you will. We will get up to get down. Keep the face in. Interesting what happens here. Uh, the first uh, couple lines, we are the lucky ones. We ain't got it so bad. Baby, you go all in. Sometimes you win, but we don't get a you bet there. Instead, we get another round of lyrics. We will get up to get down. Keep the faith. Sing loud. And on that first line, we are the lucky ones. We ain't got it so bad. It's the same harmony tucked way back in the mix again. And the same lyrics here on the first half and the back half, we get this new set. Uh, what was the thought there? You wanted to just go, go an extra measure? Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of finish the thought, I guess. Sometimes my ideas in a song can be kind of vague. I always give myself a second crack at it, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, within the song. Because first thing, I, it's got to be catchy is the first, that's my first form of business. We can make it all make sense later. It's kind of like how the sausage is made here, you know. So I think um, usually, usually around that second verse is when I get another crack at it, which is just kind of finishing the thought, you know, like, we'll be back. We'll be back in your town. And we'll have another chance to sing together. Hey, everybody, don't go anywhere. We got lots more with Trevor Riley coming right up after a few words from our sponsors. Looking to elevate your music career? DistroKid is a digital music distribution service that enables musicians to distribute their music to online stores and streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube Music, Amazon, Tidal, and many more. DistroKid collects earnings and payments, sending them to you, the artist. With DistroKid, artists unlock a world of possibilities. From easily paying collaborators with splits, to securing your music with DistroLock, DistroKid covers all bases. Plus, you can promote your releases with HyperFollow and create eye-catching visuals with a Spotify Canvas generator, all for free. But that's not all. Introducing the DistroKid app, now available on iOS and Android. Artists can manage their releases, view streaming stats, and withdraw earnings, all from the palm of their hand. And for those looking to perfect their sound, check out Mixia. With its simple interface and customizable mastering options, artists can make their music sound polished and professional within minutes. And don't forget about Instant Share, DistroKid's newest feature. Share large files securely with collaborators, producers, and more, ensuring your music streams at the highest quality. Ready to take your music to the next level? Download the DistroKid app and explore their suite of tools today. Plus, listeners can enjoy 30% off their first year by visiting distrokid.com slash VIP slash Demakes. That's distrokid.com slash VIP slash Demakes. Hey friends, have you been loving Chris Demakes a podcast? Well, spread the love by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Don't hesitate to share what you enjoy about the show in an actual written review on Apple Podcasts. Not only does it help more people discover us, but we often read reviews in the rap segment of the show. It's a quick, cost-free way to support us and takes just a minute of your time. Your reviews mean the world to us and help us keep the podcast thriving. Thank you for being a listener and thank you for being a friend.
And now back to the show. Chorus two, uh, same overall instrumentation as chorus one, but we get an extra tag line here on chorus two. That whoa is here. Harmonies again on tell me why I'd wait so long to break these chains around me. And then that extra tag line is why'd I wait so long to break these chains? There's a nice harmony on that as well. And at this point, we're only like a minute 14 or something into the song. I didn't write it down, but we got a lot of song left and there's so much that happens from this point. You're the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers. There'll be no guts, no glory. There'll be no guts, no glory. Tell me why I wait so long to break these chains around me. Why I wait so long to break these chains. It was at this point in the song where it's like, you know, I, I used all those adjectives to describe you guys earlier. Oh, they're they're punk, they're hardcore, they're this, they're that. But there's like progressive elements here too within your band. And I feel like getting into this solo part and stuff, we, we really get into that, particularly uh, right after the bridge, which is the next part. Give them all Tell them we'll be back again, you Bedford Perry. Give them our regards out there. Tell them we'll be back again. New Bedford, bury me somewhere near you. Uh, This is straight out of chorus two. The chord progression changes. Uh, This is almost, I'm calling it the bridge, Trevor, but it's almost like a post-chorus. I think with this, it was sort of like uh, our love letter to where we come from. You know, we've always flown the flag of where we come from. Uh, when we first got signed to Nitro Records back in the day, they were writing, oh, oh, this is our new signing from Boston. Uh, Oh, these guys are from Boston. Boston, Boston, Boston's all I heard of. And and it was like, yeah, excuse me. We come from a city. We're from New Bedford. We're not going to rep Boston. We're not Mm -hmm. representing Boston. And they didn't understand that. They said, well, you know, people are going to be blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I don't give a flying fuck if that gives us a little bit more attention. We're from New Bedford. So any chance that we can get, we kind of fly that flag. And no matter where we go, this is definitely one of our most popular songs in the set. If I went to, you know, Wiesbaden, Germany, you know, or somewhere, have they heard of New Bedford? No. Maybe they've heard of Herman Melville, Moby Dick, but chances are no. But they're singing. They're singing New Bedford, you know, that like... It's always been something we're, we're really proud of where we come from, you know. We're we're, we're proud of the music scene where we, where we come from, and I think that where we do come from has really not only shaped our sound but shaped our personalities. And you know, the never die, the underdog. We're underdogs it's, to this day. We feel like we're underdogs, and that I feel like that that gives us strength. That gives us power. You know, speaking band wise, I think when any of us theoretically, you know, look at ourselves in the mirror. There's no other band I would want to be. Yeah. You know, so it's just about pride. Yeah. You, you, you sound like you took, a, it's a page out of the Lesson Jake playbook. I mean, that's, yeah. we've always been felt the Gainesville, underdogs. Gainesville, maybe. Yeah, Ga- Gainesville, which we're going to get to a line here in, in a moment. I can't wait, can't wait to talk about that. But yeah. I have to ask... The next part, actually, before we get out uh, of the bridge, uh, we get harmonies on Give Them Our Regards Out There and a harmony on New Bedford, Bury Me Somewhere Near You. And then the next part, uh, there's four bars of a noodly rock and roll solo panned off left. Is that your father? That one is Mike Sapina. That one's Mike. Okay, so it's the end when your dad comes in. And the interesting thing... The very end, yeah. The interesting thing is it almost sounds like it could be the same player. It's very almost like, where did this come from? It's like Black Flag or Descendants throwing in a solo. It almost seems a little out of place, but the more you listen to it, it's perfect. You could have went with anything here. And what's great about it is it's only for four bars, followed by 10 bars of this mid-tempo uh, kind of just rocking that the band is doing. And the guitar off left is playing this more riffy part for, for those 10 bars. But really interesting. How did you uh, settle on that? Hey, for just four bars, really short, little rock and roll solo. And then we're going to go into this mid-tempo part. I love it. So... I actually talked to Mike Sapina on the phone yesterday about this. Um, <laughs> nice. Because initially I wanted to, I was like, hey, do you have any 
you know, I smoke a lot of weed, Chris. I, I don't have any fucking brain cells left. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I don't remember shit. That's not your fault. <laughs> yeah, right. It's not my fault. I, yeah, yeah, it's not it, my fault. It's the strain up there in Massachusetts. Blame it on yeah, that. It's right. too good. Too good. <laughs> and, and Mike said, said, oh, actually, Trevor, originally, that like guitar interlude, Mike's idea for that was to have that be placed earlier in the song so that, that originally he wanted to put that uh after the first verse okay um to kind of kind of kind of like lead us into the second and you know like i was saying earlier you know there's you know a thousand decisions to be made and i think i think that for whatever reason i said well you know what i think it might be pretty effective to do it later on in the song maybe after the second verse because i wanted to I wanted to have that breakneck speed. I didn't really want to. I didn't really want to give a break until a little later on, uh, for whatever reason. You know, probably would have been awesome. You know, where he suggested it too. <laughs> you know, it, wh- wherever it would have been. I mean, he's a monster player, just like Brian is. You know, those guys are like fucking insanity. Yeah. You know, the rest of us are like, you know, we're super blue collar. Like, I don't even know. I don't know names of chords, dude. I don't know. <laughs> I don't. I don't know scales. You said E minor earlier. I'm like, yeah, yeah, E minor, Chris. Yeah, 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 yeah. What you said. You know, but I don't see, know any you, of that you, shit. You, you don't need to. See, you could sit here and tell me, yeah, I read and I know all these scales. I'd believe you because you're, you're that good. So don't, don't, uh, don't underestimate <laughs> your abilities, my friend. But I know what you're saying. I'm only good at the shit that I come up with myself. <laughs> That's it. But I can't tell you what it is <laughs> or, or how. But, um, but yeah, that, that's pretty much, you know, Mike. Yeah, Mike Sapina just fucking ripping. That dude, I mean, still to this day, man, I haven't seen a I mean, I haven't seen a better guitar player at anywhere. That's awesome. And I, I feel the same way about Brian, honestly, too. We're very lucky to to that both those guys kind of came into our uh, orbit. Uh, is this you on vocals smiling at the imperfections as they disappear over the horizon? Is that you? Yeah, that's me. Okay, okay. Yeah, I saw the live videos. I thought that was you. It just it sounds like it sounds like your voice. I thought that was you. We get harmonies on the back half as they disappear over the horizon. Uh, the whole band, it's like four hits that are happening on this line. And then we get the next four lines. The whole band is in on this lyric. From Rain City to Gainesville, we ran. Then back to Melville again, with whiskey-soaked tails half-forgotten, still in the bottle at the bottom. Yeah, that's uh, Nuno's line as well, that one. Is this a verse, or is this another bridge? It's I, I consider it a bridge. Okay. Um, I actually... Me too. I actually, um, with that one, like, I think a, a big part of my role in the band is kind of like to be like the, like, like the motivator, you mm-hmm. know, the challenger, the, the one that challenges... Everybody. translation the one who pisses everybody off in the band because i'm that guy hey what if we try it this way dude we've already tried it 42 ways stop yeah yeah totally man <laughs> is that you yeah <laughs> yep that's it man so like i we, and with this in this case i was like ah nuno we need a bang in uh bridge here you well, know? I, so I, I love it i i really yeah. think the the other part that uh, starts with give them our regards I think that's your bridge. I think it's separated by whatever it ends up being, 14 or, or, or 16 bars of, of the solo uh, and then the other uh, mid-tempo part. Uh, for this second bridge, we get harmonies on every line here before we get into chorus three. And man, I love what happens here. Talk about flipping the script again. Chorus three uh, is a morph, a mashup of... Of the back half of Chorus 2. It's so awesome. Uh, and the band is just tearing your head off here speed-wise. At the bottom, tell me why did I wait so long to break these chains around me? Why did I wait so long to take the reins of my life? Why did I wait so long to break these chains? Why did I wait so long to take the reins? Because the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers, they are being no guts, no glory. There be no guts, no glory. Yeah. 
Tell me why I'd wait so long to break these chains around me. Why'd I wait so long to take the reins of my life? Why'd I wait so long to break these chains? Why'd I wait so long to take the reins? And then the chorus three is continued. And we now uh, take the first part of chorus one. Uh, this is awesome. We are the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers. Here be no guts, no glory. There be no guts, no glory here. What was the thought there? I, I love it. I love how you how you flipped it. Thanks. Um, like for me, like, why did I wait so long to break these chains around me? My style of like lyric writing, it's very like... Um, it's very Dear Diary style, mm -hmm. <laughs> as I like to say. Um, always kind of like the first person. You're sort of like, you know, I'm, I'm Irish, so we don't do therapy. <laughs> you drink your problems away. <laughs> you drink your problems away. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like, you know, I get it all, get it all on the page there. Get those feelings out, so then you don't have to like deal with them in your everyday life. You know, you kind of get over it. Is Rain City a reference to Seattle or just kind of all over Vancouver? The... Vancouver. That's a reference to Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. So okay. like, b basically, like from the stretches of Vancouver to Gainesville, which would be Fest, right? The yeah. mecca, you know, the punk rock mecca that it is, and then back to Melville, which is New Bedford, Herman Melville town here. Yeah, and you know Moby Dickville. So yeah, that's that's pretty much it. And I and I think that also what Nuno was also touching upon was, you know, also the like the lives of kind of like, you know, all the characters that have been in this in this city over the years, you know, all of the all the fishermen, you know, and like the pirate style, you know, they still walk down here, you know, the, you know, you still see them walk, you know, they get off the boat and some of them spend their money, you know, some of them go go drinking you know, throw their money around and, you know, especially when, when we were in our like twenties and stuff like that, you know, we'd always go to, you know, we'd go drinking and, you know, we'd find ourselves drinking at bars with these dudes, you know, who just been kind of like out there scalloping and kind of like, you know, risking their lives out there for a couple of weeks and then kind of like having their release when they get home, you know, having a drink you sure. know, and stuff like that. So, yeah. So it's sort of like having that, that, that kinship with that sort of, uh, that sort of journey. I love that. Wayfarer. I, I love being able to pull uh, all of the inspiration from where you live. And it's not just the guys walking around. Think of all the ghosts where you live. Think of the stories Ooh. from hundreds of years past and that type of, uh, of energy. The back half of Chorus 3, the second half, we are the noisemakers, the modern wayfarers. There's four whole band stops again with these big snare hits. And this part uh, kind of is like the four stops that happen when your vocal happens in the second part of the bridge. I like how this happens again uh, here on the second half of, of Chorus uh, 3. And then out of this comes... The outro. I've been guilty, I know that, believe me. I admit I've been bored, I've been lazy. Down and up. I'm calling this the outro. Uh, again, I believe it's you on vocals. The lyric is, I've been guilty. I know it. Believe me. I admit I've been bored. I've been lazy. And we get these big dramatic hits again with the whole band on this line. That line kind of goes back to my Dear Diary type type of style, the self-deprecating uh, Greg Dully, Afghan Wigs influence on me, which is basically like being kind of like an introverted kid where when I'm writing songs, I feel like I'm 10 feet tall, you know? I feel like nothing can fuck with me, you know? And I still feel that way. That's still like a big thing that songwriting does for me, just on a personal level. If I write something cool that day, man you're going to see a smile on my face. You know, I'm going to be very pleasant. <laughs> you're riding a high the whole day. It kind of set, sets the tone. Absolutely. So like with that, with that line there, there's been times where just, I've been, I've just been the kind of like that sad guy, you know, sort of like a self-imposed kind of loneliness, especially in my early twenties where all I did was write songs. All I did was like write lyrics and just kind of get it all out. You know what I mean? And I was going to college, you know, I was in co I was still in college at the time. So, I had sort of changed my major, so I was doing a lot of reading. That's also a thing that I wanted to kind of like bring up if we're talking like lyrics, you know. Uh, nothing advanced me more in terms of like knowing what I want to say, how I want to say it in a way that connects with people than reading like literature. 
a lot of this, you know, Victorian era literature and shit like that. Stuff that when you read a line and it doesn't just mean one thing, it means like three things. Yeah. You know, and studying a lot of that stuff really carried me, carried me through. So if, if I'm ever stuck with lyrics, I just read a little bit, you know, re, you know, read some stuff. So like, I think that's kind of what it was, you know, I, I was sort of like, uh, can call it laziness or whatever, not getting out of the house kind yeah. of style. You know what I mean? Not getting out and pressing the flesh. You know what I'm saying? Like not like being an outgoing person, you know, it was all kind of inward. Cause I was like, so like, so into my art, especially at that, at that point in time. Down and out on Cherokee Street. Give our regards to them till we return again. New Bedford, bury me somewhere near you. Down and out on Cherokee Street. We get another harmony. The whole band is back in on that line after the big drum hits. Give our regards to them till we return again. New Bedford, bury me somewhere near you. We get another harmony on that line. I feel like these last couple lyrics in particular kind of tie the whole song together in a way. Yeah. Cherokee Street's the street I grew up on where we wrote most of our songs. I mean, what we would do is like, you know, like my family's house, you know, my parents would basically house everybody, you know, because, you know, Brian's Canadian when he come down here, he'd basically stay with my folks. And this is bit this is before any of us had houses and stuff. We were on the road for probably eight to nine months out of the year for a good clip there, just touring, come back home, write songs, you know, record them, get back on the road, you know, doing our thing. And um, yeah, that's like a tribute to like uh, the Riley family, you know, um, basically really like a haven for all of us, you know, like definitely our band's biggest supporters, you know, my, my, you know, Joe and Diane, my parents, you know, uh, basically like the band mom and dad, you know, super supportive. And yeah, every Monday we'd be in the basement just going nuts. They'd be, the whole house would be shaking. They'd be eating dinner, but they didn't give a shit. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's all my family knew. Like my father, he did the same thing. My uncle Jim did the same thing. Like, you know, my grandparents, those Rileys back in the day in Dartmouth, literally shit would be shaking off the walls and they would not care. My grandmother would just be smoking butts, drinking scotch, telling stories <laughs> like there was no, you know, you know, so like that, that has been the Riley thing, you know what I mean? And it never occurred to me that like, not all families are like this, you know? No, well, and, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's funny you say that. And I didn't know that about you. And I, I think it's, it's so awesome that we did this prior to our, our tour coming up. I can't wait to talk to you. I came from a musical household. I don't know if you know that. My mom and dad were musicians. And uh, I love hearing that because I thought that was the norm, too, until I got out and realized that most people's parents don't play an instrument. You know, if they do, their dad might fart around with a guitar on the weekend or something or play a few chords here and there. But it's not like what our parents did and what we have and that is that is so cool which we're going to talk about your dad right now on this outro guitar solo predominantly pan left on bars six through 14 we get another lyric with a harmony somewhere near you it's real big harmonies held out on bars 15 through 21 the oo vocals continuing underneath the band this solo, it sounds very reminiscent of what I called the noodly rock and roll solo uh, from earlier uh, in between the two bridges. But uh, how'd this come about? And, and again, if you're just listening to this, it sounds kind of like both parts, like you handed the guitar off to the second engineer in the studio, go, hey, just lay down a guitar solo. It doesn't really fit in the context with the rest of it, but yet it does, if that makes sense. It's so cool. It's like a breath of fresh air in this really uh, intricate, riffy song. And uh, what, what was the thought there? Yeah, so I really wanted my dad on the record. I was on his record when I was 10. Yeah, you know, and then another record of his when I was thirteen, you know, and you know, yada yada yada. But my dad was, you know, and he was always going, "Oh, I haven't, pl- oh, I, oh, Trev, I haven't played it," you know, like, you know, he's so, he. We're, we're very similar in the in the way that uh, we both started out on drums first, right? And if we're playing guitar, it's for a purpose. It's because we're we're writing a song. Like I, I don't just bust out a guitar and say. Ooh, for the love of guitar, I'm doing this. I'm just not that guy. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like I got like I gotta be writing a I gotta be writing something. I gotta be working on something, you know, like and he is the same way. So 
I said, oh, dad, you got to get on this. You know what I mean? Because he was always around. You know, he's always like, hey, Trev, oh, yeah, oh, you know, you guys, you guys, you know, smoking a cigar or whatever. He's like, oh, you know, you guys should do this. Uh, you know, you know, we're like, yeah, 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 we're not going to do that. So I said, oh, come on up. So he, he got the, his Les Paul custom out, out the case from underneath the bed, you know, tuned it up real quick. I think he took like, I think maybe a couple, maybe two passes at it. I think it's when he took his ball cap and put it on backwards. Ah, he the route the rally cap. That yeah, yeah. <laughs> and 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 Mike had reminded me that the detune thing, the bam, right at the very beginning. Yeah. That was from what that was from one of his takes. No kidding. Yeah, yeah. He like he knew he he knew that he wasn't gonna be using the uh the uh, low E string. He was going for the seventies, you know, wack a wow, wack a wow, 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 you know, that you know, that kind of thing. Which is exactly what I wanted. I, I did not want it to be, because if we were going to go for like Shred City or whatever, I already got freaking Eddie Van Halen part two, you yeah. know, uh-huh. in, in, in Mike Sapina. He could literally do anything, you know, on the guitar. But it was more, it was more about, oh, dad, get on this thing, you know, show us what, you know, what you're feeling. And it was really cool, man, because I, I don't think he had played guitar for months, maybe even a year even. I love this part. I'll, I'll say it again, and, and it makes sense. You, you handed the guitar off to your dad. It sounds like, what is this part? But it adds this, it adds this quirkiness. I can't imagine this song without it now. And then after this part, we get what I'm going to call a coda. It's this weird thing that just it's it's this odd but really cool tag between the stereo guitars, bass, and drums, and. In between the two parts that happen with the whole band, there's two bars where it just rings out. Then it happens again, and then it fades out. And that's your song. How did that uh, cap, the icing on the cake here, uh, happen with this, what I'm calling the coda here at the end? That's a cool way to put it. Um, For me, like I said earlier, like one of the main hooks, the carrot that makes you keep wanting to work on a song, for me was the hook, uh, why did I wait so long to break these chains around me? Why did I wait so long to break these chains? That's something that I, I wanted to reintroduce that without singing that. So that's why, you know, it's the same same chord progression, but my intention was hopefully the listener will get the f- the the same feeling from that line that that line kind of gave me when I wrote it, but just with chords at the end to to kind of wrap it up. Thank you for explaining it to me. I didn't even put the two and two together. There's so much going on in this song. By the time I got to the end, yeah, it felt like a new part to me. You know, and maybe I don't know if that's what you were going for. You're like, no, I kind of wanted to hearken back without the vocals. It's the same part. I didn't get that. And now I'm getting it. And now I think it's even the song's even cooler. uh, If that's possible. That that is really, really neat. Thank you. Is it going back to like Bill Stevenson? Like he attributes this to me, like me saying it. But I I feel like that's something. This is something that Bill would say. (laughs) He would call like my form of songwriting avoid success. (laughs) (laughs) he would (laughs) and he he would mean it in the most you know endearing endearing way possible you know but i but i'd be like well bill uh you know i'm 25 i'm eating fucking mres here (laughs) yeah to fucking survive yeah uh i'm jealous of you eating ramen can we yeah (laughs) can we unlock the key to the you know hit song here you know can yeah (laughs) Uh, and stuff like that, but I, I, I think a lot of that is kind of like you know making a lot of these de- de- decisions. It's almost like uh, it's something that I can't escape. You know, like it's a, it's almost like uh, inside, it's like inside jokes, but not yeah. jokes. You know what I mean? It's like a little too inside. You know, and I've I've definitely been guilty of that, like to this day, writing songs because really like for me, job number one 
This is like before my bandmates. If I'm writing a song, job number one, stoke myself out. Hell at yeah. That point, at that point, I don't give a flying fuck about if anybody hears this song ever. I don't care. I got to get stoked. If people get with it, cool. If they don't, I still don't give a flying fuck. The second job is to stoke out my bandmates. After that, I'm not really thinking that much as long as we're executing the way yeah. that we should be executing. As long as all the all the words and the cadence, cadence before melody, man, fuck, fuck notes, you know, mm-hmm. cadence, how the words are spit. To me, that's like the, mo- the single most important thing about writing a song is the sounds that you're making with the voice, how they lay on top of the beat. Really, um, a lot of times, and I guess, I guess Boat Builders is a good example of this, I like to write linearly in, in, in a linear fashion. You know, mm-hmm. um, it starts in one place. I'm not thinking about where it's going to end until I'm at the end. And then when I'm at the end, if I can stoke myself out and say, ah, oh, that was clever. Yeah, mm-hmm. you did something clever. Cool. That's when I know I'm done. That's when I know the song's done. You know, sometimes that shit takes years. You know, I've got songs on my phone that ain't that ain't done yet because they ain't done yet. Right. You know, because I haven't stoked myself out yet. And really, that's everything. I, th- I feel like songwriting is kind of like a con game. You know, you're, you're conning yourself because there's about there's a thousand other fucking things I'd rather do over the course of a day than write a song. Sometimes, you know, that, you know, go to ther- go to f- self therapy. Fuck that shit. Let's watch a movie instead. <laughs> You know, you know, face our face our demons. Nah, fuck that. Let's go get a fucking bite to eat. Let's go get a drink. Let's smoke a bowl. So, really, these these little dopamine hits that you know, ah, I came up with that. Sh- ah, that's cool. Keeps you going. Keeps you going. You know, I keep conning myself into figuring out these songs. You do it long enough, all of a sudden you're sitting on a fucking grip of songs and you're feeling pretty good. I love it. Well, talking about keeping things going, you guys are keeping things going. You got a uh, latest record was Lose Your Delusion. Love the title, by the way. Thanks. From 2022. Uh, and we are just completed our tour together that hasn't happened yet uh, over in Europe with you guys. But what do you have uh, happening after uh, after everything? Uh, this episode's uh, August 26th today. So what do you, what do you got coming, uh, coming up after this with the Wilhelm Scream? Well, it'd be in August 26th today in about two weeks. Uh, we're going. We're doing uh, a West Coast run with uh, the Fantastic Strung Out and the Adolescents. Oh, awesome! That's going to be all over the West Coast. Uh, a fuck ton of Southern California, which is awesome. And then after that, after that run, we're doing uh, Fest in Gainesville, which we haven't done in a couple of years. So very excited to get back there. You know, play. Uh, love that fest. Always loved it. Um, love your hometown, man. Gainesville is fucking rules, man. Awesome. Fucking love it. Let Lesson Jake and Hot Water Music, man. Those are like going way back. Smack and Isaiah, 1997, dude. Like freaking George and Chuck both working the door at the Hardback Cafe when we played there. You know, I <laughs> yeah. couldn't believe it. I'm like fucking starstruck over here and yeah. stuff. Um, yeah, we so we do that. And then right, right, right from Fest, we go out to, uh, we're doing a South American tour with Face to Face. Going to Brazil. Oh, that's uh, awesome, man. That's so cool. Yeah, it's going to be sick. So, yeah. And then um, and then after that, we uh, continue. We, we've been writing a lot. We, uh, we're we already working on, an, on our next record. Ben, Brian, and I have been doing a lot of, uh, we call them like songwriting boot camps where, you know, Ben Ben will come out here. We'll write, you know, we'll write for a week, get Brian out here. We've done two of them, two of them in New Bedford where we just write for like 12 hours and smoke weed and just have fun. Uh, we did another one. We went out to Joshua Tree and we did another session. So we got a really great grip of songs. So like, I think we're gonna probably take December to uh, keep writing and uh, you know get the get everybody's input on on these on these jams. Get everybody writing on the stuff. And then uh, yeah, next record. Uh, hopefully uh, early next year, we'll uh, we'll record the next one, which we're really excited about. So we're still hitting it hard. Still having fun. Can't wait to hear it, and thanks so much for sitting in. It's, it's so good to see your face. It's great to see your face, man, and uh, yeah, can't wait to see you, man. All you guys, it's going to be a fucking blast. Thank you so much. I love the podcast. You're fucking awesome. This is the only podcast I listen to <laughs> that is not 1980s wrestling-based. <laughs> okay. I, wa- I don't even watch wrestling. I'm not even really into wrestling. I just love hearing these old guys talk about the old days going up and down the road for some reason. So I listen to that stuff. 
and Krista makes a podcast. That's it. You're killing it, man. I love it. Hey everybody, the song you're hearing right now is Gimme the Shakes from a Wilhelm Scream's newest album, Lose Your Delusion. This band's incredible. If you haven't heard this album, you should go listen to it. As soon as you're done listening to this episode of Krista Makes a Podcast, which we got more coming up right after a few words from our sponsors. This is the story of Whitney Houston. This is the story of Kurt Cobain. Of George Michael, of Otis Redding, of Amy Winehouse, of Michael Hutchins, Bob Marley. This is the story of Prince. It's a new podcast series. About how they died, why they died, and why we're still talking about them so long after. It's like nothing you've ever heard before. It's storytelling. But it's more than that, because rock stars... They tell us how we feel. They change our mood. They change the clothes we wear, the people we hang out with. The way we remember things. It's them who give us those ludicrous moments, the ones where you're... Jumping around, singing your heart out, feeling understood. And it's those moments we'll help you remember, the ones you're thinking about right now. That feeling. That feeling. It's coming soon from Crowd Network. Just search for Death of a Rockstar on your podcast app. And subscribe now. Hey there, Krista Makes a Podcast listeners. Ready to take your podcast experience to the next level? By signing up for the supporting cast at KristaMakes.com, you not only ensure the continued production of our show, but also unlock exclusive perks. Subscribers receive a weekly bonus episode of our other podcast, The After Party, co-hosted by Chris Fafalius and myself. Many fans rave that The After Party is just as enjoyable as the main show. And with close to 200 music-centric episodes in the archive, there's a treasure trove of entertainment awaiting you. Thank you for tuning in and for your support in keeping the podcast going strong. Join us at KristaMakes.com and let's keep the fun conversations going. As we near the end of the show, here's a band you might not know. Welcome to this week's Band You Might Not Know. If you'd like your band to be considered for Krista Makes a Podcast, email your best song via mp3 only and a short bio to ban you might not know at gmail.com this week's featured artist is beer wolf a punk rock band from sydney australia and these guys should get together with wilhelm and do some shows total rippers their latest album is their third full length overall titled common grief here's a snippet of their song dog's way home With Chris and Chris. Chris, there were a few things in this episode that I'd heard before and I love. One of those being that he said, You know, if someone in the band is laughing, you're on to something or you're doing <laughs> something cool. You know, this part's so cool that it makes you laugh. I feel like there's an episode recently where we talked about this, right? And that was ringing a bell with me too, and I can't think of it. But man, it's so true though. You ever had those band practices where you walk in? And the mood is great. Everyone had some dinner. They're not too full. They're not hungry. Maybe you're on your second beer. Whatever's going on, everyone's in a good mood. You just have a great practice. And then there's the flip side of that, where it just nothing seems to be working. People are cranky. And uh, I, I, I totally related to that, uh, that statement. Yeah, for sure. If you do something that is so cool that it actually makes you laugh. You know, it's probably pretty good. He also talked about, you know, I've been there a million times, 
really working out the songs beforehand because you don't want to be working them out in the studio because that costs a lot of money. Of course, you're going to do some pre-production. Maybe you'll change some, some things around, but having your songs really fleshed out before you get in the studio is going to save you probably thousands of dollars Mm -hmm. so you don't want to mess around too much with that yeah on the same token not to be argumentative you know chris i've come in so prepared sometimes i call it maybe over over prepared to where you have demoitis you think i i got this part locked it's perfect like eh, it's actually not working as well as you thought it is there pal (laughs) that's a good point man that demoitis that's a that's a real condition (laughs) that we that we all get and you got to be able to let that fall away when you're work, especially if you're working with a producer who is going to want to change things. So you can't get too set in your ways, but also I wouldn't go in there completely unprepared. Maybe somewhere in the middle, Chris is the best way to go. Uh, you guys talked about less than Jake is no stranger to this, but flying the flag of where you came from. And uh, Trevor even said, yeah, people would call us a Boston band, but we're not a Boston band. We're from new Bedford, new Bedford, <laughs> Massachusetts. is where we're from. Maybe a lot of people don't even know New Bedford, Massachusetts. I knew New Bedford, Massachusetts well. I have a lot of friends from there. And there is also a group of people that we call the New Bedford crew that were always the rowdiest Uh at the punchline shows in Massachusetts. So we've had our share of experiences of New Bedford. So I see why they would correct people on that. Well, you know, he had mentioned playing the fest too, and there's a, a, a reference of Gainesville in the lyrics, but you know, Les and Jake had a song called Gainesville Rock City. I mean, it could, can't sure. get more tongue in cheek than that. You know, but people have come to the fest. I've seen people from other countries, England and Europe are like, Gainesville, like we thought there'd be like huge skyscrapers. It'd be this big, you know, city. It's like, no, it's just a small little college town. (laughs) So I could totally relate to what he's saying there about New Bedford. We're proud of where we're from. Sure. New Bedford, Gainesville. Hey, man, even to a certain extent, Pittsburgh. These are underdog cities, smaller towns. You know, that underdog mentality talked about gives you strength and gives you power, he said. And I believe in that. It's like you're you're the Rocky here. You're the underdog. You know, <laughs> you're you're not from New York or L.A. or Chicago, some some big city or something. You're just from this this town that might not have that many bands. And you kind of kind of have a pride in that. And I think that's cool. And I also think it's cool as far as pride goes, Chris. I know you had this shared experience with him of having a family that plays music, having that tradition go through the generations. That's really cool. I didn't have that. Nothing against my family, really. There was some distant... Rel- well, actually, my grandpa played music, but I didn't really know that uh, You know, on, on my mom's side. But uh, yeah, that's, that's really, really cool that he had such a connection to music through his family. Well, yeah, and just through the lyrics, you know, how he talked about writing uh, a song linear, like, you know, here, here's where it starts out and here's where, where, the, where the story ends. And just having his dad on here, so many questions were answered. I kept thinking like, man, this guitar solo, it's cool, but it just, it sounds so different from the rest of the song and what they were going for. But at the same time, uh, such a great breath of fresh air and a cool part. And, and as I said to Trevor, I can't imagine the song without it. I also love that he said that he wants to get himself stoked on a song first. That's priority one. Priority two is getting his bandmates stoked on it. And that point, whatever happens, happens with it. I think that's a a pretty good approach. Okay. Well, good. I'm glad, Chris. And if you haven't already, uh, please join our supporting cast. We love the reviews. Those keep people interested. But the supporting cast... Keeps the lights on over here at Krista Makes, uh, a podcast. Head over to KristaMakes.com where you can sign up for the after party. And you get bonus episodes where Chris and I will talk about all kinds of stuff. And Chris, we were talking earlier. We're going to get our own game show, Defeat the Makes, back for an after party for a supporting cast exclusive, as well as the journey and some other stuff that we've had in the past. Defeat the Makes, you can come on and actually uh, play me uh, in music trivia, and Chris will be the uh, amazing uh, host of that show. So head over to ChrisDemakes.com for all of that info. And these five-star reviews, Chris. Man, I have one of the nicest reviews we've ever had. It's a long one, so I'm only going to read an excerpt from it. It was a five-star review from someone whose name on Apple Podcasts was underscore JJN. 
But they said, no need for preamble. This podcast is so exceptional that it has made listening to any of the podcasts I previously enjoyed virtually impossible. Believe me, I have tried and I soon find myself pivoting to a back episode of Chris to Makes a Podcast instead and being glad I did. And JJN just went on and on and uh, said, though it's certainly music focused, this podcast is really for everyone. You listen to an episode and walk away feeling good every time. And that is a powerful gift these guys endlessly provide their listeners. So uh, yeah, this is a very long review, but thank you, JJN. Uh, anyone out there, go check out JJN's review <laughs> in, in the reviews uh, of our podcast on Apple Podcasts. And anyone else, we really appreciate those reviews. That's really nice. That's right. And we can't believe it. We pinch ourselves all the time. It's been over four years in running here on Chris Makes a Podcast, over 220 some odd episodes, and we could not do it without you. So thanks for listening. Thanks for all your support. And I want to thank this week's guest, Trevor Riley, for sitting in with us. And we'll see you next week. One Hit Thunder is a podcast where we both celebrate and have a good laugh about bands and artists that had just one hit that we all know. Each week, we're joined by a guest from the world of music or comedy to learn more than you ever thought you would about some songs that you can't forget. And we decide if they brought the One Hit Thunder or were nothing more than a One Hit Blunder. Look, if you listen to the show, you're probably going to laugh, and I guarantee you're going to crush next time the bar has music trivia. Tag Team, Jane Child, Meredith Brooks, Looking Glass, Sean Mullins, Eiffel 65, EMF, Crash Test Dummies, Crazy Town, Chumbawamba. We have hundreds of episodes in our back catalog and a new episode each week. So pass the duchy, make sure you're connected, and subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods. One Hit Thunder is a podcast where we both celebrate and have a good laugh about bands and artists that had just one hit that we all know. Each week, we're joined by a guest from the world of music or comedy to learn more than you ever thought you would about some songs that you can't forget. And we decide if they brought the one-hit thunder or were nothing more than a one-hit blunder. Look, if you listen to the show, you're probably going to laugh, and I guarantee you're going to crush next time the bar has music trivia. Tag Team, Jane Child, Meredith Brooks, Looking Glass, Sean Mullins, Eiffel 65, EMF, Crash Test Dummies, Crazy Town, Chumbawamba. We have hundreds of episodes in our back catalog and a new episode each week. So pass the duchy, make sure you're connected, and subscribe to One Hit Thunder wherever you get your pods. Hey, this is Steve Choi, host of the Musicians Guild podcast, part of the Sound Talent Media Podcast Network. Within the four walls of the Musicians Guild, we'll be discussing the habits, idiosyncrasies, experiences, and general psychology of my friends and peers all involved with music in various capacities. Listen and subscribe at SoundTalentMedia.com.